So, <laughs> yo, House of the Dragon was a wild episode. This episode had me so excited. Um, and I'm gonna just hop right into it, right? Because, like, this episode, it, it opened up wild with Rhaenyra storming in on Adam like a mom catching her kid playing with fire. Literally. Like, she's all fire and brimstone ready to rain on Adam's parade. And it kind of makes sense because, you know, Rhaenyra was counting on that dragon to increase her numbers in the war with the Greens. Um, it could have been a problem. But Adam was cool about it, explaining that he didn't really want any smoke with Rhaenyra, right? He wasn't really looking to stir the pot. He's just a guy that the dragon picked. Meanwhile... Sea Smoke and Cyrax started to size each other up. And just when we thought we might get some Dragon Royal Rumble WWE, the tension kind of fizzled out, but it was just like a tease, right? It was a tease. I know I was ready for some Dragon action. Now, my man Adam, you know, he says that he's ready to bend the knee. And Rhaenyra, after getting after an emotional roller coaster, she actually started to warm up to this unexpected ally. Did I mention how much I love the diversity in this show, right? They didn't just cast black people. They cast dark skinned black people, which I feel just needs to happen more. Anyway, that, I just had to say that. Um, we then switched to Allison, who's patching up her latest boo-boos. And what's with these rats, right? They're like a medieval version of a bad omen. Anybody else notice that this rat popped up again? Um... Allison decides that she needs to change the scenery and she ropes in Sir Rickard for a field trip out of the castle. Uh, Eamon, ever the strict HR manager, is sending knights to the wall for protecting Allison, right? Those knights that were sitting there when Allison got attacked last episode with Helena, they were charged with inciting a riot. A little bit harsh, right? And Lord Jasper and Sir Laris are busy gossiping about Sea Smoke's new rider like it's the latest hot gossip in the castle, like it's trended, like it's trended. And Jasper wants to be the bearer of bad news to Eamon, but Laris, you know, ever the schemer, suggests maybe just keeping it under wraps might be smarter. Which is wild, because, you know, he is the master of whispers, right? Isn't sharing his information supposed to be his thing? Uh, we also see that right near his Black Council bonds out finds out that the person riding around with sea smoke works for Lord Corliss. Um, and Rhaenyra brought the dragon rider back and instructed her team that he should be taught how to ride a dragon and be taught to speak High Valyrian. Corliss backs up her decision, which I thought was kind of cool, but Jace isn't happy about it, and especially because he's feeling like he's being shut out. And I can't even front. He has a legit reason for being concerned, and I'm going to touch on that in a little bit. Um, it's in this moment that we see Rhaenyra return to her room, but interestingly, she only consults with Mysteria. And Mysteria reminds Rhaenyra that there are a lot of unclaimed Targaryen kids running around Westeros. Daemon, Viserys, and a whole horde of Targaryen men before them would just lay seeds in brothels and leave them behind. Mysterio reminds her that maybe if y'all stop acting like they don't exist, then maybe you can go find some dragon riders. And this is tough for Rhaenyra, and, it, and she tries to give it some legit level of thought, even if she doesn't see how this is going to be a problem for Jace down the line. Um, Adam gets his first taste of the finer things in life, as he's given a room with a bed in a castle. Uh, Lord Corliss walks in looking like a king. And Adam asked if he could please be allowed to be a dragon rider, please, sir, daddy. And I love this moment. I love this interaction between Corliss and Adam because so much is being said without being said. You know, he's just like, you, you grace, my, how you've come up. And then the one thing that really, really touched Adam was when he says, well done. And I swear to you, the only thing Adam hears is I love you. Uh, we didn't switch to Damon meeting with Asuka Tully and Damon tells Asuka to fall in line. Um, they promised their swords to Viserys. So that also means that they promised their armies to his name, Air. Um, Asuka tells him that he made a mess of things. And look at this mess. Look at this mess. 
And Damon ain't even worried, but Oscar is like, dude, they all hate you. All the houses hate you. And I, I love how Oscar and Damon have this interaction in this episode. We see more of it when Damon steps outside and the lords of the different houses are waiting under that weirwood tree. And Damon basically tells the river lords to just act like it didn't happen. Right? All that crazy, just act like it didn't. So? Oh, on top of that, Oscar promised me all your armies. And they start realizing that they're listening to a child. Right? It's in this moment they start questioning, why are we even doing it? Oscar tells them something very clever. He starts role playing a little bit. He's clearly an educated game player. Grandfather, grandsire taught him well. Oscar tells them that he hates Damon too, but he's honoring tradition, and that means falling in line with Rhaenyra and her husband. Damon kind of doesn't like this kid talking slick about him, but he also swallows his pride in order to get what he needs. William Blackwood is the first person to get in line and pledges to his house, but Oscar gets on his ass for the way that he waged war on the Brackens and arrests him. Now, Oscar then gets gangster and tells Damon to just take William's head. Damon, Damon, so I, it took me a while to process why Damon did it and what was going through his head. And it's in this moment that I had to understand that Damon raised up this dude sir sir william blackwood to be his number one this dude was just his hitman he was doing all the dirty work and damon while he's not a wholly honorable man he's a somewhat honorable guy especially to those who are working with him him taking william blackwood's head was a sign of like contrition he didn't want to get rid of his number one right this is like I don't know, uh, uh, a Jedi master taking out his Padawan. It's not really what you want to do, but because of all of the things that he's learning, all of the lessons that were instilled in him while in Harrenhal, he's realizing that he can't just be the same Damon he's always been and be successful. Either way, this was a really cool moment. I really enjoyed the slick talk from oscar i love the back and forth and i love how this is affecting damon and we're seeing his character grow even if i am sick of this Harren hall story look at that appreciate you e-man stopping by just dropping some support for team black get those likes up y'all support this channel i appreciate you my guy e-man from e reviews y'all already know So again, this episode was really cool in that moment. We got to see what happened with William Blackwood and we got to see Damon's growth in that moment. Um, what happened... I could comment? I didn't even know I could comment. So Damon then goes into his room uh, with that bed made from the weirwood tree. But before he sees that, Am I the only one who's noticing this recurring theme to goats? Like, goats are clearly a terrible sign, right? If you see a goat, it's it's got, like, some pagan symbolism. My guy keeps seeing them as he's walking through Harrenhal. This is just another sign that Damon is about to go into a dream. I also wonder if this goat is Alice Rivers. Maybe she can shapeshift into different animals. One thing that she said earlier in the season was that she was an owl forced to take the shape of a human being and i wonder just how much she was joking damon then goes to his roman with that bed made from the weirwood tree and we see old king viserys sitting on the side of the bed and then he tells him how you know the crown is more like a weight and a burden and it's not really something that you really want and Damon really begins to process how much the crown has taken from him and his pursuit of the crown. And I really enjoy seeing this character. I, me, I'm a sucker for good character development. You give me a character with a really good arc and I see how they've come out the other end transformed in a meaningful way. And you have me every day of the week. This is my kind of story.
Uh, we then switched to see Maester Orwell trying to get Aegon to practice walking. And Sir Laris kind of barges in while Aegon is in agony and then sets him up to look like Aegon's savior. And Sir Laris even gives him a pep talk to work harder to get in walking shape. And I was wondering about this moment because he even spoke to Maester Orwell and was saying something along the lines like, you know, he may not have a lot of time to practice walking. And I can't help but wonder if Sir Laris is planning to smuggle Aegon out of King's Landing. Like, maybe he's just going to get him out of there. We then switch to Lord Corliss telling Adam to go run some errands for him for the war. And he also tells him that Adam is a dragon rider. And for the very first time, he tells Alan. Excuse me. For the very first time when he's telling this to Alan. He kind of acknowledges Alan as his son anybody else notice this like when he when he saw Adam he had a moment where they started to talk about their lineage their blood and how their blood came from old Valeria and to my knowledge I don't think he really acknowledged or had a conversation with Alan where he spoke to him as father to son he explains how Adam is a dragon rider his brother moved up in the world and it felt like in this moment that he also asked Adam if he wanted to ride a dragon too and try to be a dragon rider and Adam just kind of like played it off and he was like yo I'm from salt and sea and I love how Adam said that because it was exactly the same line that we heard from Bela earlier in the season when she said look grandsire you want to name me heir to Driftmark, but I am fire and blood. And what Driftmark needs is salt and sea. And here comes Adam saying that same exact thing. So I'm really excited to see how they further develop Adam as a character. You already see he's wearing Lord Corliss's sigil on his chest now, now that he's his first mate. It only needs to go a little bit further, Dad. Uh, we didn't switch in. We see uh, Reyna leaving the veil to go to Pentos. Uh, but as soon as Lady Jane closes the door, Reyna runs off from her caravan and heads out into a nearby valley, uh, following the signs of the wild dragon that you heard about last episode. Now, I love how she's taken an interest in this dragon. I don't know too much about the books, but I do. It does feel like that they're changing something here. I don't want to spoil anything. I'm sure some of y'all might say it in the comments. But I'm wondering what direction Rain is going to go and whether or not she may be looking to claim this wild dragon. Uh, we didn't switch to Allison out in Kingswood with Sir Rickard and it looks like they're pretending to be freaking homeless. Right? They look like they got they got like half a time. They look like they pretending to be homeless. And Sir Rickard asks Allison if they're just pretending. And Allison's like, I don't, I don't really know if we're pretending. I mean, we might just stay. Yeah, and, and I understand why she would want to be out here instead of the castle. The castle is not really that most ideal place to be right now. Uh, we then switch to Jace and Rhaenyra, and Jace is feeling himself, right? Jace is, like, upset. He starts talking all sorts of reckless to Rhaenyra, kind of like a new president talking to an incumbent. He's getting more and more upset about the decisions of the old cabinet. And Rhaenyra lets him have his tantrum, but also reminds him that they're in a war and they're outgunned. Now, Jace is worried that one of these Luke Spittle randoms might start saying that they have more a more legitimate claim to the throne than this dark haired dude. And it really might be a problem for him in the long run. When you took Harwin Strong into your bed, did you think I might favor him or did you did it not cross your mind? And and this is a legitimate problem for Jace. Right. Because think about it. We saw what happened in this episode with Hugh and Alt claiming dragons. Alt's dragon is bigger than Jace's. Vermithor is ginormous. Let's say hypothetically Rhaenyra wins the war, takes the Iron Throne and then passes away. Obviously, the next person to succeed would be her named heir. But we're living in a time when we know things don't go that smoothly when someone else can challenge your claim to the throne. We know Hugh 
is of royal lineage and he's closer to the throne probably than jace is with silver hair purple eyes and a giant dragon when rainier is gone what's him to just say actually it should be me this is a problem and rainier lets us know that she honestly didn't think about that right and jace is screwed now I'm also starting to see that Nysaria is possibly playing a much bigger game than we wanted, than I gave her credit for, right? Because what if Jace's worst nightmare really did happen, right? And that one of these small folk Targaryens wanted to make a claim. Wouldn't that kind of line up with what we've been hearing from the small folk so far, especially Nysaria? What if she was able to manipulate the whole King's Landing, the Greens and the Blacks in order to raise a Targaryen that was raised with regular folks to rule over the Seven Kingdoms instead? You know what I mean? Like, think about that, right? Because Viserion could just be sitting here playing a long game. Why not Alt? Why not Hugh? She might think that's better than what we've been seeing with Aegon Hing and the Rat Catchers and Aemon being an absolute monster. So again, I think, I think Miseria is playing a much bigger, much longer game in the long run than we're actually giving her credit for. And Rhaenyra is falling right into her trap. We're going to see how this one plays out, but that's my theory right now. I think Miseria is, is on to something. Uh, let's see. Oh, what else happened? Oh, here's the news that Rhaenyra. What you got for me, Fernandez? Oh, first off, Fernandez, thank you. Welcome. Welcome to the show. Appreciate you. Uh, Team Green, Otto for press. Yo, Otto needs to come back, yo. Otto needs to, like, he was, he was the best hand in Westeros history because he was the hand to Viserys, the king before, for Viserys and King Aegon for a while. And when you think about it, it, Viserys and the king before him were years of peace. So Otto was a good hand until he wanted to just be crazy and seize power and put Aegon on the throne without realizing how to control him. I was talking to my buddy Eman about this earlier, and it's not like when Tywin and the Lannisters were putting uh, Joffrey on the throne. Because when Joffrey was on the throne, yeah, he was a monster, but he was a monster that Tywin could control. The king is tired. Send him to bed. You guys remember that, right? Otto couldn't co control Aegon. Aegon fired him and made Sir Criston the hand. And Aegon just went into hiding. So I do respect Otto. I do think that he was the best hand that we've seen thus far. But he he made a tragic mistake. Yeah, Miseria doing a side quest against her queen is really interesting. So I'm curious where this really goes and what we're going to see uh, going into the final episode. Fernandez T says, we need more intrigue, to be honest. Not much twist this season. So, ooh, excuse me. So. Yeah, you know, I could see that. There wasn't really a too many twisted... Well, I mean, let me think about it. Like, the season opened up with a pretty big twist. I didn't expect um, Jaehaerys, the king's son, to go out the way he did. Um, I didn't expect the battle at Rook's Rest to go the way it did. I'm not a book reader, so I didn't really see that coming. When Rhaenys was taken out, that, that, <laughs> that was a surprise. That, was, that messed me up. But I was disappointed that the pacing slowed down since then. I think this is probably the closest to the pace that we've seen in that episode in, uh, at the end of this one. And I'm really, really hoping that it picks up on the season finale. Um, just a little bit of insight for you all. I, you guys know I'm a critic. I receive screeners. I'm allowed to see these episodes a little bit earlier in order to help prepare my videos for the recaps. This episode came really late. This episode came really, really late. They held off on giving us this episode um, until it was really close to release. I'm assuming because they didn't want any spoilers or leaks. And furthermore, 
we're not getting the finale. You hear any critics saying they've seen it? It's cap. We're not getting the finale. Uh, I'm really, I'm really close with the folks at HBO. If it was going out, I'm sure I would get it. We're not getting it. So whatever happens in this finale is so it's 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 so sensitive to the folks at HBO that they don't even want screeners out. Now I know back in I think it was episode one in my first recap, I looked up the actor uh Alan of Hull. And if you look him up on social media, you'll see that his avatar is a picture of Adam in full armor. Now we haven't seen him in full armor in the show yet, but he was dressed in full armor. So that tells me either they cut it out of a previous episode or we're going to see it in the next episode. So I'm excited to see what they do with Adam in the future episodes. But Fernandez, yo, appreciate you. Welcome to the channel. Um, for all six, seven, eight, nine, ten of you guys watching, look, uh, I think Gothic Chick knows this. I do like to do giveaways. I'm going to give some information about a giveaway later this episode. I've been wondering a few things I've been wanting to give away. I have my talisman. I've been wondering if I'm going to give that away. I have a few movies that I give away for critic stuff. I also have this whole thing I got from uh, National Geographic about that about Shark Fest. I'm ready to mail out my next gift box. If you want a gift box, I'll probably do two this week. Do me a favor. Email me promotions at the movieblog.com. I'm only giving this to y'all who are live streaming. If you're interested in getting a free bag, box of swag, I will mail it out to you. Uh, email me at promotions at themovieblog.com. I will email you back. We'll exchange information and I'll send you a tracking number. I uh, appreciate you all for coming in here. This is just my token of appreciation. I really hope to continue doing this and I appreciate you giving me your time. But let's get back to this episode because... Uh, we, we saw that my man Alf was out here, uh, he's been drinking and, uh, he finds out that Rhaenyra is recruiting Targaryen bastards and he gets a little, he gets a little nervous, right? He gets a little nervous cause he's, he says straight up, I'm not a hundred percent sure I'm really Targaryen, right? That's just what I was told. And it's not like they have Mori, right? There's no Westerosi DNA tests out here. The best that you can tell is by your hair color. But the other people in the bar remind him that he's been drinking for free and they've all been paying for it. So if he's not Targaryen, it's going to be a problem. And they conveniently start to chant together to hype him up to go. I thought that was kind of cool. Um, we then switched to white-haired Hugh, breaking it to his wife that he wants to go to Dragonstone too, to ride dragons, right? Who, who likes dragons? His wife asks why he can't just get a job right why can't you just get a job she says and his and he says look my mama was in these streets and it, it's a lot of childhood trauma and there's only one way to make it right the only way i can make this right and address this regret about losing my daughter is to get me a dragon <laughs> And his wife says he's an idiot and that she doesn't really want to get see him get taken out and end up as a widower. But this is where we at. Uh, we then see him and a long line of other white haired people who board in some boats, including his cousin, brother, Alt. We, we'll cross that later. Uh, we then switch to see the new arrivals come into Dragonstone. Let me switch this back. There we go. Give you out a full deal. Uh, we didn't switch to see the other uh, arrivals coming to Dragonstones. A lot of Dragon Siege arriving. Um, and the Dragon Keepers are upset. Yo, though, they, they came at her like a union rep. <laughs> like, yo, know, they were so mad that these offspring um, were showing up like this. And the you, oh, Fernandez, I appreciate you, my guy. First off, shout out to my guy, Fernandez. Thank you so much for do uh, donating to the channel $10. I really appreciate that. I appreciate that. Um, I like Team Green due to Otto, but I haven't researched who's worse between them two gays. <laughs> However, I don't like how they're trying to lead us to the like the blacks, like they good people. They're both wrong. No, you you 100% right on that. I was uh again having a conversation with my buddy Eman about this, and I was explaining this is all Rainier's fault, right? If Rainier wasn't just acting 
out of pocket when she was younger, you know, just sleeping with whoever she wanted and not caring about consequences, it wouldn't have gotten this far. Sure, Aegon being born was always going to be a challenge to her legitimacy for the throne, but it didn't help that she started rubbing people the wrong way along the way, right? When Kristen Cole switched sides and went team green and started fanning the Rhaenyra hate flames, it really, really didn't help her at all. Um, but you're 100% right that the show does lean towards a bias in showing the blacks being more favorable than the greens when the greens are just as much a victim as the blacks. Eamon is only like this because he's been teased a lot and lost an eye. Allison is only like this because her father forced her into a position to marry the king and have his children. And then those children are only in the position they're in because their mother didn't love them the way that she probably should because of her circumstances. So I'm 100% with you that the greens aren't as bad as the show makes them out to be. They're more so upset but yeah 100 percent. i'm with you on that i really appreciate that fernandez t uh, thank you so much for that donation uh let's see but yeah i really appreciate it thank you guys so much um but yeah back to this episode these dragon riders they start pressing rainera like it's a union right and they're upset about all these offspring that Rhaenyra is bringing in. And they're, they're like, yo, we, we don't want to work with these people. And she's trying to get these people dragons. And they say straight up, they ain't working with no dragon bastards. Go on strike. Uh, Rhaenyra then talks to her. <laughs> yo, this dude. Uh, Rhaenyra then talks to her nephews, nieces, and cousins and gives them motivational speeches, uh, part pep talk, part survival guide because one wrong move and these seeds are dragon chew. Uh, and then she starts taking the dragon seeds down into the dragon pits to try to bond with Vermithor. And man, yo, yo, does this get good? This is when things really pick up. First off, I learned that Rhaenyra could talk to Vermithor, right? I did not know Rhaenyra or Targaryens could be cool with other dragons like that. I didn't know that. I thought once they bonded with their one dragon, that was kind of it. They kind of were close with them. But to see Rhaenyra to be have a conversation with Vermithor and touch him, she, she kind of had a relationship with him. And now I'm just wondering, can all Targaryens talk to all dragons? Is this their thing? How, how does the magic work? Um... After Vermithor shows up and Rhaenyra gives us that money shot, uh, she gets a volunteer. And then she kind of leaves the extended Targaryens to give it their best shot. Yeah, this is this was a cool shot right here. This this right here I didn't see coming. Um, I'm kind of curious. I might look into it a little bit more. I'm curious. Has there ever been a time with a Targaryen ever bonded with more than one dragon at a time? Or is there some other reason why Vermithor was so cool with her? Like, was she, was Vermithor coupling with her dragon? Like, what, what was the reason? Uh, but yeah, this is a cool little moment seeing her bond with him. We see this money shot with Vermithor Sto standing behind her, kind of mirroring that season one image that we saw with Millie Alcock standing in front of Vermithor. Um, really love this scene. Um, as things go further, we see Jigsaw Targaryen uh, decides that he's going to try first to speak with this dude. <laughs> and meanwhile, Rhaenyra, she just goes somewhere safe to go watch from a much safer distance. Vermithor looks like a prop, right? Vermithor, like, I knew he was really, really big. I didn't realize how big of a problem he was. Like, he's not quite as big as Vagar, but he does look fearsome. Vermithor doesn't like the smell of any of these no-frills Targaryens. None of them. Take your family dollar asses back. And he starts roasting them up to the flavor he likes. 
off. He got knocked off a ledge while Hugh runs wisely and hides. And yo, Verma Thor just starts going in on the rest of these Targaryens. Yeah, Gothic chick for you. Absolutely right. They should have known. They should have known. <laughs> like they kind of did know. But one thing that we keep seeing is that yeah barbecue one thing we keep seeing is that the way that these people look at dragons is kind of like you know they're, they're almost like religious deities they're gods there's something close to gods there's something that they just can't really fully comprehend and the idea of the targaryens being to tame and ride these beasts make the targaryens more godlike. so now the regular folks are raising the Targaryens up on a pedestal. When these silver-haired, purple-eyed, Valyrian-speaking dragon lords saying they're the rightful heirs of Westeros, it's really hard to question them when they're controlling these fantastical beasts. So, yeah, they should have known, but they also had hope. It's almost like, what if I'm special too? What if you were that person who was always picked on? What if you were your own version of Peter Parker? And they said one day you could be Spider-Man too. And that's kind of like how these Targaryens felt. But then Vermithor starts going in on the rest of them. And he starts eating all of them. Or at least as many as he could. But my guy would really did go full kaiju on them. Um, and it, it was looking wild. Uh, look at this. They got cooked crosses burning fire the the are the even rainier's guards got burnt the ones that was holding them back from running everybody got cooked just to the way that vermithor likes you know the exact season and flavor um and this is the first time i think i've actually seen a dragon eat people right i they they went full kaiju in this episode right i've seen them eat goats and this is the first time i think i've actually seen a dragon eat people which is which is a little unsettling Right now, he's got a taste for it. Um, but yeah, at least Hugh was man enough to be able to see all of this and have this little moment with this woman here. Now, I was curious about this moment, about this silver haired woman. When she ran in front of Vermithor, Hugh got up and started to yell at Vermithor in order to save her. And the one of the things that crossed my mind was, why did he do it? Why did Hugh risk his life to save hers? And Hugh kind of explained a legit reason why he might have done it in that his mother was a Targaryen, but she was a woman who worked in the pleasure house. And when he saw her in that moment, I wonder, is this the first time he's been this close to a white haired woman um, since his mother? Right. When he saw her in danger, he shot up. And it's in that moment that I started to wonder, yeah, I think my guy, I think my guy right here is having a mommy moment. He wanted to save her. He found that courage. He got up and he got in Vermithor's face and aggressively told him to heal. And I love that because it's clear that Vermithor respects strength. When Rhaenyra was talking to Vermithor earlier, she like he Vermithor started to get a little I ain't gonna say he was testing her but he he wasn't really listening right away but when she was like obey Vermithor when she started talking to him a little bit more aggressively that's when Vermithor was like all right all right you could pet me and I think that that's what makes the bronze fury different than the other dragons it feels like you have to satisfy some sort of emotional requirement in order for these dragon riders to accept you. He gets in Vermithor's face. He tells him to heal. Vermithor respects it. And we see out of all these half-breeds. Vermithor has picked a rider. Fernandez T. I was damn sure they would make one of these beautiful silver-haired ladies a dragon rider for more eye candy for the viewers. But alas. So... It's not too late if you if you want to see more silver-haired beauties riding dragons. Um, in the next episode's preview, they did have a moment where they show Aemond speaking with... Whoa, hold on. Maybe I... But 
spoiler alert for any of y'all who like to go into these episodes pure i'm gonna give you a second cover your ears um but there is a preview in which Amond is talking with helena and he tells helena look i'm gonna need you to hop on dream fire and we're gonna ride out into battle and that is setting up for the final episode it's not going to be a 20 v one right we, we not we not jumping drake today this looks like they about to have a fair fight because they keep reminding us that there's another targaryen named dayron who has a blue dragon that is just taken to wing and helena has a really really large dragon called dreamfire i think her dragon is like it, I think I want to say it's bigger than Rhaenyra's, but smaller than Damon's. It's like it's like maybe about the same size as Adam's dragon. So we're gonna see some more silverhead ladies on dragons. Just you wait. This next finale, we we up in there, Fernandez. They they got us. Um, but yeah, yo, Oath claimed the dragon, and I'm I'm cool with him getting Vermithor. I'm curious to see how this turns out because this is jace's big problem right here this dude right here this is jace's big problem for after rhaenyra takes the throne and it's time for jace to ascend he's gonna have the biggest dragon in the world if they take the iron throne because i'm assuming Vagar would have to go but yeah let's let's see how this story progresses from here um we then go on to see that my guy Ulf. My guy Ulf, yo, he's he's an interesting dude. He goes uh even further into the dragon pits while running for safety. And he sometimes somehow he didn't even realize that he was stepping in dragon eggs. Did you guys see that? He stepped on dragon eggs. Like he stepped in it. Like I I he took out it looked like he took out a dragon. I mean, he did notice eventually, um, when he noticed that my guy has stumbled on uh Silverwing. But yeah, he he's he stepped in dragon eggs and maybe some hot dragon poop. But he definitely broke a dragon egg. But um Silverwing pops up. And when we're sitting here wondering, like, yo, is he about to go full Vermithor on him? He's about to eat him? Is he gonna give him a hard time? No. Silverwing surprises us all and just immediately swipes right. Uh, we didn't see Aemond and his ultra small council going over war strategy and letting us know that Prince Daeron's dragon Caesarion has taken to wing and expects to join the fight. Now, here's wild, the wild thing to me is because we learned this last episode. We learned that Daeron's dragon Caesarion took to wing when Alicent was speaking with her brother Gwen in the yard. And he was like, yeah, he's flying. He's He's cool. He's ready to join the fight. But Aemon is just now finding out. I don't know how many days it's been or how much time has passed, but Aemon is the last to know this information. And we now know that his small council is withholding information to, from him selectively because they all hate him too. Oh, Fernandez, what you got for me? Uh, Fernandez T says, is it possible that is the reason why the dragon chose him? Maybe one of the qualifications was to break one of their stale eggs. Maybe that egg had a sick baby, so the rider destroying it pleased her. I know that's a stretch, but you think it's possible. Um, I mean, anything's possible, right? I, I can't, anything is possible, 100%. Is this a reason? Why, I don't know. You know, a lot of times when they... I'm, I'm going to like fall back to the normal maternal things outside of drag or instincts that I see out of animals outside of dragons. Like if you go by a bird nest, right? As a human being, you go in the nest, you see the eggs. If you touch one of them eggs, it's a wrap. Either the bird is going to attack you before you get to touch it. Or if you actually get your scent and the oil from your skin on the egg shell, they're going to crush the egg themselves. They they don't like their eggs being handled by other people. And it usually gets a really bad reaction. Um, it's definitely possible, but I'm not 100% sure. I, honestly, I just feel like Silverwing is a much more playful dragon. 
when you think about kind of like how uh, Aegon's dragon was, right? It was a beautiful golden dragon. And as soon as he saw it, it's like rub noses with him. I'm real. I'm wondering if this is if if Silverwing is more like that. She's a sheen dragon. Um, I believe she couples with Vermithor, and those are her and Vermithor's eggs. But I think she's just a little bit more chill than her husband. <laughs> but yeah, that that's anything is possible. Um, I'm curious to see if we learn more about why dragons choose their riders as the show goes on. Uh, I think our next big opportunity will be if Reyna finds that wild dragon in the veil that I think is Sheep Stealer. I think that's Sheep Stealer. So we'll see. Uh, but yeah, it's, it's an interesting question. I'm curious about that. I'm, I'm going to remember to dig that up and uh, try to come back to that in another video. But yeah, Eamon, his ultra small council meeting, they... None of these guys like him. They're not telling him information when they get it. And he is just now finding that Dayron's dragon took to wing. They definitely didn't tell him about the sightings of Sea Smoke with a rider, uh, even though they learned that at the beginning of the episode. Because while they're in this meeting, we hear that there's a ruckus going on outside. And they hear the ruckus because there's a dragon flying over King's Landing. We see the scorpion arrow is not fast enough to shoot at it. And then we see my guy all flying around on Silverwing going for a joyride. It, th these guys had a good idea with the scorpion gun, but you, you got to be a little faster, bro. You got to be a little faster. You, you, what's the point? I like how Eamon quickly got on the bat cycle and tried to ride out to go grab Vagar. And the two of them immediately got, start chasing off to go see what the F is going on. I like how Eamon is ready he's always ready for the smoke he's always ready um but but that's until he sees that they're heading to dragonstone and even with all one eyes limited vision and peripheral he still thinks twice about what he's getting himself into and i like how vega still kind of seems to want to fight and he's like nah man flee flee this is this is not good. This is not a good situation. Vagar is ready for the smoke, but Eamon is smart enough not to go to keep going in that direction. And we see why. It kind of looked like it was a trap. On one hand, I'm like, all right, there's no way Ulf was sent out there on purpose. But the other hand, I'm like, how the heck did he get all the way from Dragonstone to King's Landing and nobody went chase? Nobody tried to stop him. Rhaenyra knew that she needed a dragon seat. She didn't want to try to bring this nobody, nothing. So then it started to make me wonder, what if this was a trap for Vagar? Yeah, it's, it's kind of soon to be setting traps because he just got the dragon. But I had to start and think, I had to stop and think about it. Rhaenyra is not she, there's a there's a there's a possibility she's having some temporary insanity because you got to think about it. since the end of last season when her son Luke uh, was was taken out by Vagar, she's been bottling in her rage. We see this look on her face sometimes, and it's just full of rage, but she can't really express it because she's got the wisdom of Viserys tempering it. She wants to take out and go to war against the greens she wants to take her dragon and attack king's landing but she's got a lot of responsibility this is the first moment with her uh firmithor uh, silver wing and sea smoke with four dragons this is absolutely the very first moment when she actually had enough weaponry to win and i wonder in that moment when she's just like all right one two three four four dragons let's go avenge look did she have a moment where she was just like get him was she anxious to go and get at the person who took at her son but yeah that that was an incredible episode those it was it was an amazing way that it ended i really really enjoyed this episode i can't wait to see what they do next week um but yeah that that is 
everything that I have for this week. Oh my goodness, we've been going for almost an hour and a half. Thank you all so much. I know there's some of you who are checking in on Facebook, uh, some of you who are checking in on YouTube. For all my Instagram people, thank you. I appreciate y'all for watching this live stream. I do it all for you. I'd like to do this again next week. Let me know if you like these uh, weekly recaps. Um, I can continue doing House of the Dragon. I can also continue adding in this movie news. And I might even sprinkle in some reviews and interviews. Maybe I'll just start bringing actors and directors onto the show itself. But I really appreciate you all. If you checked out this live stream, don't forget promotions at the movieblog.com. I'm giving out a swag bag of get goodies uh, straight to your mailbox. Uh, hit me up. Let me know what you guys think in the comments. Otherwise, I'm going to check you all later. Peace. Mm-hmm. I don't want to go. I don't want to go.